Motion is something we usually observe in our daily life. To understand the nature of motion we study Newton's laws of motion. Sir Isaac Newton published three laws for the motion of moving objects in this universe, which appeared in his book Principia in 1687. But these laws cannot be proven from any old theory of physics. As a result, these three laws create a new branch of physics called kinetics. So let start with uh, chapter 5, our first chapter on the concept of force and its relation to motion. Let's remember what we said uh, a few lectures ago, that chapters 2 and 4 dealt with kinematics, which is the description of the motion as a function of time. Chapter 2 for one-dimensional kinematics, chapter 4 for three-dimensional kinematics. In this chapter, we start to investigate the causes of the motion, which is what we call dynamics, forces. And we will start with some basic definitions and concepts that you already have studied in your high school, but just to refresh our memories, sit uh, the ground, uh, prepare ourselves to deal with dynamics, Newton's laws, forces, and so on. We have described the motion of objects in terms of position, velocity, and acceleration. That's kinematics. Now, the question now is, what can cause an object to accelerate? Okay, there is acceleration, it's related to velocity and position. The question is, why do we have acceleration? What causes an object to accelerate? And the answer to that is, the cause of acceleration is a force. We say that a force is said to act on the object to change its velocity. If the velocity changes, there we have the acceleration. The relation between a force and the acceleration it causes was first understood by Ishaq Newton. The study of that relation between force and acceleration is called Newtonian mechanics, which has three laws of motion that we are going to study in this and the next lecture. Newtonian mechanics does not apply when objects move at very high speeds, which is close to the speed of light, or for extremely small objects like atoms, electrons, nuclei, and molecules. It works perfectly well, Newtonian mechanics per works perfectly well for ordinary objects. So as long as you are far away from the speed of light, which is the case for uh, all ordinary objects that we encounter in our ordinary everyday life. And as far as you are away from atoms and electrons, um, Newtonian mechanics is extremely uh, perfect to describe the motion of objects. Let's now start with the first law, Newton's first law. It's a very simple conceptual law. There is no much mathematics. Uh, involved with Newtonian's, uh, Newton's first law. Before Newton, it was thought that some influence, a force, was needed to keep a body moving at constant velocity. So if you want to move something with constant velocity, you need a force to do that. Similarly, a body was thought to be in its natural state when it was at rest. These ideas are not completely wrong, okay? They were reasonable for, example, if you send the puck, and the puck is this uh, piece that's used in the game of hockey. If you send the puck sliding across a wooden floor, it does indeed slow and then stop. Let's take an example. Here is an object, that's what we are saying here. Here is an object, okay? And here is a wooden floor, if I send it, Okay, if I uh, kick the object or give it some force, 
we see that it will move some distance and then it will stop. If you want to keep it moving with constant velocity, you have to apply force. The force is applied by the hand. So you have to apply a force to keep it moving with constant velocity. So these ideas were reasonable to some extent. If you want to make it move across the floor with constant velocity, you have to continuously pull or push it. <coughs> now, suppose you send the puck to slide over an icy floor. Let's say that instead of the wooden floor, we have an icy floor like the surface of a frozen lake. You can imagine that it will travel longer in this case. Indeed, in this case, the surface is said to be frictionless. That means it has no or very little uh, friction. If it means the surface, if the surface had infinite length, the puck would never stop. It would just keep moving forever. And note that it will move without a force applied to it. From these observations, we can conclude that a body will keep moving with constant velocity, like the puck on the icy floor, if no force acts on it. So, with this we can now state Newton's first law, which says if no net force, you may have many forces, but they cancel each other. If no net force acts on a body, the body's velocity cannot change, and that means the body cannot accelerate. If the net force is zero, the acceleration is zero. In other words, if the body is at rest, it stays at rest. If it is moving, it continues to move with the same velocity. With that, we are now in a position to talk more about force. Force is a vector that has magnitude and direction. When two or more forces act on a body, we can find their net force or resultant force by adding the individual forces vectorially using the methods that we have studied in chapter three. This fact is called the principle of superposition. Superposition in the language of mathematics is another name for adding. It could be algebraic addition, it could be wave addition, it could be vector addition. Now we use it to add vectors. The net force has the same effect on the body as all the individual forces together. There may be many forces acting on a body, but if their net force is zero, if they add up victorially to zero, the body cannot accelerate because the net force is zero. That leads us to talk about a very important concept, which is the concept of inertial reference frames. Briefly speaking, before we go here, if you want to measure a force, you have to be in an inertial frame of reference. If you are not in an inertial frame, you cannot make correct measurement of the force. So let's discuss this idea. And we will start by restating Newton's first law, which says, if no net force acts on a body, then its velocity cannot change. And that means the body cannot accelerate. Newton's first law, requires a special set of reference frames which are called inertial frames. So what is an inertial frame? Here is the definition of an inertial frame. An inertial frame of reference is one in which Newton's first law is valid. But that's not really a clear definition, okay? We are going around. A better definition is to say that an inertial frame of reference is an unaccelerated frame, okay? If you want to make measurement of force, you have to be in an unaccelerated frame, a frame that is at rest or is moving with constant velocity. Any reference frame that moves with constant velocity relative to an inertial frame is itself an inertial frame. An elevator or taking off plane are non-inertial frames. However, a truck or a train traveling with constant velocity can be considered as inertial frames. Now let me give an example to illustrate, to clarify the concept of the inertial frame. Let's say that 
uh, you want to go to an airplane for flying, okay? So you ride the bus from the terminal to the airplane. So here you are in the bus. The bus is going on a straight road in the uh, airport, uh, the taxi road. And let's say that while you are in the bus, which is driving at constant velocity, there is a man standing on the runway. Okay, so you have this man standing and you pass by him. What is your conclusion about the man? Well, your conclusion is the man is at rest. The net force on him is zero, so he is not accelerating. Is that the correct conclusion? Yes, that's the correct conclusion. And you made that correct conclusion because you are moving in an inertial frame, which is the bus that is driving with constant velocity. Now let's say that you are uh, uh, on the airplane and the airplane is now taking off from the runway and we have the same person standing in the same location and you pass by him but now you pass by him while you are in the accelerating airplane what is your conclusion now about the person your conclusion is he is accelerating backward with an acceleration that has the same magnitude as the airplane but in the opposite direction so your conclusion now is that the object, the man, is accelerating. There is a net force acting on him, which is the wrong conclusion. The person is at rest, he is not moving, he is not accelerating, the net force on him is zero. Why did you reach the wrong conclusion now? Because the airplane is a non-inertial reference frame, it is an accelerating frame. So that's the idea we are talking about here. Now that leads us to talk about a very important reference frame that we usually refer to in our daily life, and that's the Earth. We usually take the Earth, the, uh, the ground, as an inertial frame. Is it, it is at rest. So the question now, is that the case? Is the Earth that we live on an inertial frame? Well, literally speaking, the answer is no, because the Earth has two rotations. One is the rotation around itself that makes day and night and the other one is the rotation around the sun once a year that makes the four seasons now these are both of the, these two motions are circular motions and we have seen in chapter four that whenever we have circular motion we will have centripetal acceleration attached to it because of the change of velocity so we have two circular motions we have two accelerations and therefore, the, uh, the Earth, since it is accelerating, it is a non-inertial reference frame. But now let's look at how serious are these accelerations. The first one, which is the acceleration due uh, to the motion or the rotation around the Sun, corresponds to a centripetal acceleration of 0 0.0044 meters per second squared. The acceleration, the centripetal acceleration, due to the rotation of the Earth around itself for a point on the equator, which is the maximum value we, we can have, is 0 0.0337 meters per second squared. Okay, so these are the magnitudes of these centripetal accelerations. And if you compare them to the acceleration due to gravity G, which is 9.8, you find them to be extremely small and negligible even if we add them which is the maximum we can get you get a value of 0 0.0381 compare that to 9.8 that's very negligible so we can safely continue to regard the earth the ground as an inertial frame because the accelerations involved are extremely small we next consider <clears throat> the concept of mass. We talked about acceleration, we talked about force. Now we talk about the mass, which is the quantity that connects the two together. A given force produces different magnitudes of acceleration for different bodies. The accelerations differ because 
the masses of the objects are different. And here is an example. Here we have a force. In this case, it is exerted by the leg of the person. Here we have a slit. If the slit is empty, the force will give the slit some acceleration A. If the slit is full of people, so the mass increases, for the same force exerted by the same person, you can see that the acceleration now is smaller because the mass is larger, the acceleration is smaller for the same force. Now suppose that you apply a force to a standard body of mass 1.0 kilograms and accelerate it by A0 uh, equal to 1.0 meters per second square. So the idea here is the following. Uh, let me illustrate it simply. Let's say that we have a standard body. Okay, this is the standard body whose mass is equal to one kilogram. And we want to give it, uh, we want to apply a force to it that will give it an acceleration of exactly 1.0 meter per second squared. So let's say that you can control the force. Let's say that you, you bring uh, remote controlled cars and attach them to the body to pull it on a frictionless surface. So one car, let's say, will give it 0.4 uh, meter per second square. You increase the number of cars, or you bring a different car, more powerful car, and measure the acceleration it produces. So you redo these experiments, trial and error, until you come up with a car or number of cars that will give this standard body an acceleration of 1.0 meter per second square. Then you know that the car is applying the force of one Newton. One Newton applied to one kilogram will give us one meter per second square. Okay, so you know what is that force. Now, you remove the standard kilogram. Okay, you remove, you remove the standard kilogram and bring another object of unknown mass. You bring another object of unknown mass. Let's call it object X. And apply the same force to it that you apply to the standard kilogram. The same force, which is one Newton. Apply to this object of unknown mass. Measure the acceleration. You find that the acceleration of the unknown object is 0.25 meters per second square. What is our conclusion? Our conclusion is this object is heavier than one kilogram because the acceleration is smaller, the mass must be larger. Can we guess what is the mass? Yes, the mass is the reciprocal of the acceleration. So if the acceleration reduces by four times, that means the mass has increased four times and therefore the mass of the unknown object is equal to four kilograms. So here is the idea. The ratio of the masses of the two bodies is equal to the inverse of the ratio of their accelerations. And here is how we uh, translate that mathematics. Mathematically, the mass of the unknown object over the standard mass is equal to the reciprocal of the accelerations. It is the acceleration of the standard object divided by the acceleration of the unknown object, from which you can find the mass of the unknown object. Okay, bring M0 here. M0 is one kilogram, one meter per second square. We found that to be 0.25, so that will give us a mass of four kilograms. Mass is an intrinsic property of the body. That means it belongs to the object. It is not affected by its surroundings. Okay, an intrinsic property of a body, and it is a scalar. So with that, here are the ideas, the introductory ideas that we have discussed at the beginning of chapter five. We talked about force. We discussed Newtonian mechanics and its limitations. We discussed frictionless surfaces. We stated Newton's first law. We considered the Victorian nature of force. We also discussed resultant or net forces, inertial reference of frames, and finally, the concept of mass. We are now ready to discuss 
Newton's second law, which is really the core of mechanics. So let's do that. <clears throat> this is now section 5.1. We are still there. And here we will consider Newton's second law. This is how I will abbreviate it, Newton's second law. Newton's second law says the following. We will state it. It says, the net force, the net, watch the words, the net force on a body is equal to is equal to the product of its mass and acceleration. Mathematically, this looks like this. F net is equal to ma. Okay, it's a vectorial uh, equation. Now you can write this into components by saying F net x is equal to m a x. F net y is equal to m a y, and F net z is equal to m a z. So these are the components belonging to uh, this equation. F net in this equation, like we said in our discussion, is equal to the vector sum, the vector sum or resultant, the vector sum or resultant of all forces acting on the body. And from here, you can immediately see that if the net force is zero, the acceleration is zero, which is Newton's first law. So Newton's first law is nothing but a special case of Newton's second law. So let us write that here. If the net force is zero, the acceleration is zero. And in that case, in, in that case where the net force is zero, the forces on the body balance or cancel each other. There may be many forces, but their vector addition is zero, so they make up a net force that is equal to zero, and the object is said to be in equilibrium. And we will talk more about equilibrium later in chapter 12. The SI unit, the SI unit of force is the Newton, which we represent by capital N. And like we said in chapter one, whenever we introduce a new unit, we will always relate it to the three base units, the kilogram, the meter, and the mass. And you can see from this equation that one Newton is equal to one kilogram meter per second squared. One kilogram meter per second squared. Of course, there are other units of force that are used in other systems other than the SI system. And here are some of them. This is the SI unit of the force. It is the Newton. In the CGS system, it is uh, another unit used is called the dyne. Uh, in the British system, it is the pound. Okay, so these are different units used to uh, measure the force. Now we will talk about an idea that is very useful to analyze dynamical problems using Newton's second law. And that is the three body diagram, which is a pictorial way to represent the forces. To solve problems with Newton's second law, we often draw a three body diagram, sketch the problem, show the forces, so we can proceed with the analysis of the problem. So in the three body diagram, we represent the body as a dot, and then each force is drawn 
as a vector with its tail on the body. A very important point. We draw the force so that its tail is on the body. If we don't do that, that's an incorrect free body diagram, and that will definitely lead to incorrect conclusion. So remember that you draw the force as a vector whose tail is at the body. Let's see some examples. Here is the physical situation. We have a person who is pulling a box on a frictionless surface. That's the physical situation. How do we represent that as a free body diagram? You can see that here. The box is represented by the dot and then show the forces acting on the box. We have the force, the pulling force due to the hand of the person. So that is F in here. And then we have the weight of the object, the gravitational force on it, that is always perpendicular to the ground. And then we have another force that is perpendicular to the, uh, the surface that we call the normal force, which we will discuss in the next lecture. So there is the free body diagram of the situation. We can now remove this one and deal with the free body diagram and analyze the forces, the acceleration of the object, and so on. Here is another example. We have a child who is pulling a plate on a rough surface. So that's the physical situation. How do we represent that as a free body diagram? You can see that here. The crate is represented by the dot, and then show the forces. This is the pulling force due to the hand of the, of the child, that's FH, there. Then we have the weight of the uh, crate, that's the gravitational force here. And then we have the normal force due to the road, the surface. And then if it is a rough surface, we have also a frictional force that is opposite to the direction of the motion. And here is the free body diagram that we use to analyze this situation dynamically. Let's now uh, look at some terminology that is usually used when we discuss forces. A system consists of one or more bodies. Any force on a body within the system caused by bodies outside the system is called an external force. Okay, so let's say that I am standing here. We know that the force, uh, the earth is exerting a, gra a gravitational force on me. So the gravitational force is considered to be an external force. Forces between two bodies inside the system are called internal forces. For a rigid body, like, uh, like the cars of a train, we neglect internal forces because they come in pairs, equal in uh, magnitude, opposite in directions, and they cancel each other. So we neglect internal forces and treat the object as a single body. So we will use these concepts, system, internal, external forces frequently, especially when we go to later chapters like the one in which we will consider the concept of linear momentum. So this is about Newton's second law. We will now consider some examples and problems on uh, Newton's second law and its uses to analyze dynamical problems. Let's start with some examples from the book. And the first one we will see uh, is sample problem 501. <clears throat> The example says, the figure shows, the figure below shows three situations in which one or two forces, one or two forces act on a puck. So here is our object that moves over frictionless ice. So here we have a frictionless surface along an X axis in one dimensional motion. So however the forces are applied, the puck moves along the x-axis. It doesn't jump up or down. It's moving only horizontally along the x-axis. The mass of the puck is equal to 0.2 kilograms. Forces F1 and F2 are directed along the axis, horizontal forces, and have magnitudes of four newtons or two newtons. Force F3, which is applied here, is directed at an angle of 30 degrees below the horizontal and has magnitude of one Newton. In each situation, we have three situations. In each situation, what is the acceleration of the puck? So let's start with the 
first one, where we only have one force acting on the object. In A, of course, in all situations, we will apply Newton's second law. That's the only thing we have. So in here, we only have one force acting on the puck. So applying Newton's first law, we have A is equal to F1 divided by M. A is F1 over M. How much is that? That is equal to, F1 is equal to four Newtons, and the mass is 0.2. So this is 40 over two, and uh, 40 over two, and that is 20 meters per second square. And this is in the positive x direction. There is only one force, it's in the positive x direction, so the acceleration will follow in that direction. Let's now look at B, situation B. Here we have two forces. So first we have to find the uh, resultant, the net force. The net force in this case is equal to, if one is positive, has a magnitude of four, if two is in the negative direction, has a magnitude of two. So the net force is equal to two newtons in the positive x direction. And therefore, A is equal to F net divided by M, which is equal to two over 0.2, and that will be 10 meters per second squared. And again, it is in the positive x direction because that's the direction of the net force. Finally, we come to situation C, and like we did in here, let's find the net force. Now, we only care about the x components of the forces because the puck is moving only along the x direction. This one here has an x component and a y component, but we don't care about the y component. It will balance the gravitational and the normal forces. The only component we care about here is the x component because that's where we have the motion. So F net in situation C is the x component of F3, which is F3 cosine of theta. It's in the positive x direction. And then we have F2, which is in the negative x direction, minus F2. How much is that? F3 is equal to one Newton. So one cosine of 30 degrees minus F2 is equal to two Newtons. And if we put the numbers, we will find that this is minus 1.1 Newton. So the net force now is in the negative x direction. So A net is equal to uh, just A. A is equal to F net divided by M, which is minus 1.1 divided by 0.2, and that would be minus 5.7 meters per second square, and that means that it is now accelerating in the negative x direction. Okay, so there we have a simple uh, problem involving the application of Newton's second law. <coughs> We will next look at this sample problem from the textbook. Okay, the problem now says the following. And we have to understand what is going on here. Okay, so. Let me uh, bring this example again. It says a two kilogram disc is accelerated at three meters per second square. So we apply three forces on this disc and find that as a result of these three forces, the disc is given an acceleration of three meters per second square in the direction shown at an angle of 50 degrees from the positive X direction over a frictionless horizontal surface. So the situation is like this. We have a horizontal surface. Remember, 
horizontal is parallel to the ground. And here we have our object, the disc. There are three forces acting on it, and the forces are in this plane. So remember that any object has a mass, will have a gravitational force. The gravitational force is there. But we don't see it because we are looking from the top, so we only see the forces in this plane. And that's where we have the motion. The, uh, the disc is moving along this plane. So the gravitational force will not have an effect in this case. And that's why it is not shown in here. So it is very important to have the correct view of the situation. Now let's come back to this disc. We said that we applied three forces, and as a result of them, we have an acceleration of three meters per second squared in that direction. We are given two of the forces. Force F1 has a magnitude of 10 newtons, making an angle of 30 degrees below the negative x-axis. The other force, the second force, is force F2, magnitude 20 newtons, along the positive y direction. What is the third force? That when added to these two will give us the acceleration that we have in here. So we have to find the third force. Let's start with what we are given. We are given F1 and F2. So let us express them in unit vector notation. Okay. F1 is equal to here is a vector, write it in unit vector notation, resolve it into its x and y components. It has a magnitude of 10 newtons, making an angle of 180 up to here plus 30, 210 degrees. So it will be 10 cosine 210 i plus 10 sine 210 j. And if we put the numbers, this will be minus 8.7i minus 5.0j newtons. Force F2 is very simple. It's along the y-axis, has a magnitude of 20 newtons, so that is equal to 20j newtons. Let's now work on the acceleration. Express the acceleration in unit vector notation like we did with F1. Again, we have a vector whose magnitude is three, making an angle of 50 degrees. So it will be three cosine 50i plus three sine of 50j. This will give us the acceleration as 1.9i plus 2.3j in meters per second square. Now apply Newton's second law. Newton's second law says F net is equal to m times a. Where is m? m is 2 kilograms. So multiply this by 2 and you get the net force which will be equal to 3.8i plus 4.6 J Newtons. That's the net force. And now remember that the net force is the vector sum of F1, F2, and F3. Let's write that. F net is equal to F1 plus F2 plus F3. What is the unknown force that we are looking for? It's F3. So we can get it immediately from here. F 3 is equal to F net minus F1 minus F2. We just subtract these two forces. So let's do that. Let's look first at the I's. F net I, 3.8 minus, what do we have in F1? Minus minus will be plus 8.7. We don't have an I in F2, so that is I. What about the J's? In F net, the J is 4.6. Minus, minus will be plus 5.0. Minus, where is F2? There, 20. Minus 20. 
j. Add up all of these, and you will find that this is 12.6i minus 10.4j in newtons. And that's the force at 3. Where is this force? It has positive x component, negative y component. So F3 will be a vector that is somewhere in the fourth quadrant. Okay? It has a magnitude of how much? 12.6 squared plus 10.4 squared under the square root. That will be 16. 0.3 newtons making an angle of theta all of that an angle of 320.5 degrees and you find that exactly like we did in chapter 3 finding the angle corresponding to a force or to a vector in a certain quadrant we will conclude our discussion here with a problem from the book about simple application of Newton's laws, and that is problem 12 from the textbook. The problem says two horizontal forces. Again, horizontal means they are in a plane that is parallel to the ground, okay? It's a different meaning from horizontal in mathematics. In mathematics, horizontal is the x-axis, vertical is the y-axis. This is not the case here. When we say horizontal, it means they lie in a plane that is parallel to the ground. So, to illustrate it, it is something like this, okay? We have a box that is being pushed on a surface by two persons, and here are the forces exerted by them. We say that these two forces are horizontal because they are in a plane parallel to the ground, although they have both X and Y components. So please distinguish horizontal in physics from the mathematical meaning of horizontal. Let's get back here. Two horizontal forces, F1 and F2, act on a four kilogram disc that slides over frictionless eyes on which an XY coordinate system is laid out. So we have two forces acting on an object. Force F1 is in the positive direction of the x-axis and has a magnitude of 7 newtons. So we know the first force completely. We know its direction and we know its magnitude. What about the second force? Force F2 has a magnitude of 9 newtons. We only know its magnitude but we don't know where is it. The figure here gives the x component of the velocity of the disk as a function of time during the sliding. What is the angle between the constant directions of forces F1 and F2? So the situation here is like this. We have two forces acting with the object. One of them is along the x-axis. The other one, we know that it has a magnitude of nine newtons, but we don't know its direction. It could be anywhere. And what we want to find is the angle it makes, the angle made by the second force. So we will first deal with the graph. What do we have with this graph? We have a graph of V versus T. Let's go back to chapter two. If I have a graph of V versus T, what can I get out of it? The area under the curve is the displacement. Do I need that here? No. The slope of the curve is the acceleration. Do I need that here? Yes. So we will use this uh, curve in here to find the acceleration of the, uh, of the object. Since this is Vx, it will give us Ax, the x component of the acceleration. So let us find that as the slope of the curve. And that will be as follows. Ax, the x component of the acceleration, is the slope of v, the velocity, versus t, or let's be careful, vx versus t. So this is equal to, find the slope, take the vertical, 5 minus minus 4, 
by minus minus 4 divided by 3 minus 0. <coughs> so this is 9 over 3, that's 3 meters per second square. And therefore, since we have the acceleration, now we can find the x component of the net force, which is equal to m a x. Okay? I'm talking about the x component of the forces. So, how much is the mass? 4 kilograms multiplied by 3, that will give us 12 newtons. What is F1? Let's first write it as a vector. F1 is equal to how much is it? 7 newtons. So this is 7i. And therefore, F1x, the x component of F1 is F1 itself, 7 newtons. Now, remember that F net, new, uh, Newton's second law, F net is equal to MA, which is equal to F1 plus F2. So if you take the x component of this equation, F net x is equal to F1 x plus F2 x. F2 x is equal to F net x minus F1 x. How much is that? F net x is 12 minus F1 x 7. So that is equal to 5 newtons. And it is positive. And now remember that the x component of any vector is equal to the magnitude of the vector multiplied by cosine of the angle it makes with the positive x direction. So the angle it makes is cosine inverse of F2x divided by F2, which is cosine inverse of F2x is 5, and F2 itself, F2 has a magnitude of 9. So 5 over 9, cosine inverse, and that will be uh, equal to, what is F2? F2 has a magnitude of 9, so this is cosine inverse of 5 over 9. And let me get that here. Okay, today we continue our discussion of chapter 5. This is our second lecture in this chapter. And let's review the ideas that we discussed in the last lecture. We introduced the concepts of force, mass, and inertia frames. We stated Newton's first law. And then we stated and discussed in detail Newton's second law. Today, we will start by <coughs> considering some particular forces that are uh, very important frequently appear in dynamical uh, problems and then we will state and discuss Newton's third law and then we will look at applications of Newton's laws to solve dynamical problems. So let's start with the first point, particular forces. The particular forces that we will discuss or explain or describe are the gravitational force, the weight, the normal force, the frictional force, and the tension. Let's start with the first one, the gravitational force. This is the force of attraction of a body toward the center of the Earth. So this is the force exerted by the Earth on the object. It is always directed downward toward the center of the Earth, and its magnitude is equal to m times g, so it is a constant force, both in magnitude and direction. This force is always present, whether the object is in free fall, at rest, on the ground, or at any level, the gravitational force will always be there. The second force is the weight, which is very connected to the gravitational force, but could be different from it. What is the weight? 
the weight of a body is equal to the magnitude of the net force required to prevent the body from falling freely. For example, to keep a body at rest in your hand while you stand on the ground, you must provide an upward force to balance the gravitational force on the body from the earth. And because of that, if the body is at rest, the weight of a body is equal to the magnitude of the gravitational force on the body. What we are saying here is the following. Here is a body. Okay, if I leave it, if I release it, we know that it will fall to the ground. So to prevent it from falling, I have to apply a force by my hand. How much is the force by my hand that will prevent the object from falling? It is equal to the gravitational force on the object. The gravitational force, let's say, is 5 newtons. I have to apply 5 newtons by my hand to prevent it from falling. So the force uh, we apply to prevent the, the, gra the gravitational force is what we call the weight of the object. <coughs> there are two ways to measure the weight of a body, either by balancing it against a standard mass or by using a calibrated spring scale. Any one of the two can be used to measure the mass and then the weight of the object. The weight of a body must be measured while the body is not accelerating vertically relative to the ground. So you can measure the weight of an object in a fast train, even if it is accelerating, as long as it is moving uh, uh, horizontally, because remember, the, the weight goes with the gravitational force, with the, which is a vertical force. You cannot measure the weight in an accelerating elevator, because an accelerating elevator moving vertically up or vertically down will have a vertical acceleration attached to it. And that vertical acceleration will uh, uh, differ the measurement of weight of the object as we will see in the, uh, in the examples. The weight of an object is not its mass. This is a big misconception in our daily life. People talk about the weight and they mean the mass. And these are two different quantities. Mass is a scalar that is an intrinsic property of the object and therefore is the same everywhere. Weight is a force and therefore it is a vector that depends on the value of g. For example, let's say that we have an object whose mass is 5 kilograms. Wherever in the universe you take that object, its mass is 5 kilograms. What about the weight? Its weight on the ground on Earth, where g is 9.8, is 49, 9.8 times 5 is 49. But if you take it to the moon, where the gravitational acceleration is only 1.6, then its weight on the moon is only 8 newtons. So the weight depends on the value of g. The third force is called the normal force. And let's understand what do we mean by normal. In the language of mathematics, normal means perpendicular. So it is a force that is perpendicular to a surface, okay? If we have two objects, okay, and they are perpendicular to each other like this, we can say that they are perpendicular to each other or they are normal to each other. So that's the meaning of the normal here. Here is the idea behind the normal force. When a body presses against the surface, if you take an object and place it on the surface, the surface pushes on the body with a normal force that is perpendicular to the surface. An example is shown in here. Here we have a block. We place it on the surface, which is the table. So the block pushes down by its weight, and the reaction of the surface is this force, the normal force, which is the force that in this case is equal to the weight, and it's perpendicular to the surface. Here is the normal force. It is perpendicular to the surface. Okay, and it will always be perpendicular to the surface. So here is the surface, and here is the normal force. Okay, the normal force to the surface. It will be like that. Okay, if I now tilt the surface, the normal force will tilt with it. Okay, so that it will always be perpendicular to the surface. One more thing. 
the normal force does not penetrate the surface. It will always point away from the surface. So if this is a table, where is the normal force? It is perpendicular to the table, and it doesn't penetrate the table. It goes away from the surface, so it would be that way. But for example, if this is the ceiling, for example, and I put something against the ceiling, where is the normal force? It is downward, okay? It is perpendicular to the ceiling, but it cannot penetrate the ceiling. It has to go the other way. The other way will be downward in this case. Now let us analyze this simple situation that we have in here. Let's apply Newton's second law to this one. So here is the free body diagram. That is the box. The forces acting on it are the gravitational force and the normal force due to the surface. Apply Newton's second law there. If net is equal to MA, the net force is equal to the normal force positive minus the gravitational force in the negative y direction, and that will be equal to M. A y. There is no force in the x direction. The gravitational force is equal to mg. Take this to the other side and take m as a common factor. So there is your normal force. It's equal to mg plus a y. If a y is zero, if the object is at rest or moving upward or downward with constant velocity, so a y is zero, then you can see that if n is equal to mg. And many students will rush and say that always the normal force is equal to the weight of the object. That's not correct. That correct that's correct in this situation because of three things. First, we have a flat surface. If the surface is tilted, we will have cosine or sine of theta there. Second, there is no other vertical force. It's only the normal force and the gravitational force. But if I am pushing down on the block so we have an extra force, the situation will be different. One more thing, there is no vertical acceleration like we said in here. If there is vertical acceleration, then the normal force will not be equal to the gravitational force. So keep that in mind, please. The fourth force, the force, the fourth force is the force of friction. And as we know from our daily experience, if we slide or attempt to slide an object over a surface, the motion is resisted by a bonding between the, the body and the surface. The resistance is considered to be a single force, which is called the force of friction, and we will dedicate a whole lecture in Chapter 6 to the study of frictional forces. We will say more about it then. The fifth particular force is the force of tension. And as you can see in here, when a cord or rope or string is attached to a body and pulled tight, the cord pulls on the body with a force that we call T directed away from the body and along the cord as shown below. The force is called tension, that's why we give it the letter T, and the cord is said to be under tension. A cord or string or rope is often assumed to be massless. What do you mean? Does it mean it doesn't have a mass? Definitely it has a mass. But what we are saying here is that the mass of the rope is negligible compared to the mass of the block. And we will assume it to be unstretchable, okay? It doesn't stretch because if it stretches, then that will make the analysis of the forces very complicated. The cord pulls on both sides, like here, for example, on both sides with the same force of magnitude, even if the bodies and the cord are accelerating. So these are the five particular forces. We talked about the gravitational force, the weight, the normal force, uh, the friction, and the tension. We are now in a position to complete our discussion of Newton's laws, and now we will bring in the third law, Newton's third law. It says, when two bodies interact, the forces on the bodies from each other are always equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. That's Newton's third law. When two bodies interact, they exert equal and opposite forces on each other. Let's take an example. The first example is where we have a book leaning on a crate, on a box uh, crate C. Let's analyze the forces here. 
and we will only care about the forces between the two objects. Of course, there are other objects, uh, there are other forces like friction, normal force, gravitational force. They are there, but here we are only talking about the mutual forces between the two objects. What are they? We have two of them. The first one is called FBC, watch the order of the letters. It's the force on the, uh, the, force on the book from the crate. And this one is FCB, the force on the crate from the book. Okay, they are here. The book pushes the crate to the right. So that's this force. The force on the crate due to the book. The reaction to that is the crate tries to push the book to the left. So that's this force. This is the force on the book due to the crate. Newton's third law says that these two forces are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. The third law would still hold even if they were accelerating. If you take this situation and put it at the back of a truck and the truck is accelerating, you still have this relationship between these two forces. FBC and FCB are called a third law force pair or vaguely in our daily life we call them action-reaction forces. Let's take another example, and that one is one, the one shown here where we have a cantaloupe sitting on a table. Let's analyze the situation. The forces on the cantaloupe are, there are two forces acting on it. The first one is the uh, FCT, which is the force on the cantaloupe due to the table, and that's basically the normal force that the table exerts on the cantaloupe. The second force is FCE, which is the force on the cantaloupe due to the earth, and that's the gravitational force on the cantaloupe from the earth. The question now is, are these two forces Newton's third law force pair? The answer is no, because third law force pair have to act on two different bodies, while these two forces that we show in here are forces on one object. To have Newton's third law, you have to have two objects. So how many pairs do we have? We have three pairs in here. The cantaloupe table, the cantaloupe earth, and the table earth. We have three pairs. How many of them are connected to the cantaloupe? Two pairs. The cantaloupe table and the cantaloupe earth. So these are the two pairs associated with the cantaloupe, okay? What are the third law force pairs associated with the cantaloupe? They are the cantaloupe earth interaction, which will go with the gravitational force, okay? FCE is equal to minus FEC, and the cantaloupe table interaction, which will go with the normal force. So we say FCT is minus FEC. And that's how Newton's third law works. That completes our discussion of Newton's laws of motion. And now we come to the last part of the chapter, which is really the dense part, where we look at applications of Newton's laws. How do we use Newton's laws, especially Newton's second law, to analyze dynamical problems? And we will look at some examples from the textbook today, and we will continue in the next lecture by looking at some problems from the textbook. Let's first start with the examples in the book. Here's the first example, sample problem 503. It says the figure shows a block S, the sliding block, so it is given the letter S, with mass capital M of 3.3 kilograms. The block is free to move along a horizontal frictionless surface and connected by a core that wraps over a frictionless pulley to a second block H, the hanging block of mass small m, 2.1 kilograms. The cord and the pulley, the cord and the pulley have negligible masses, so we don't have to worry about their motion compared to the blocks. They are massless. The hanging block, you release the system from rest, so the hanging block falls as the sliding block accelerates to the right. What we want to find 
is to find the acceleration of the sliding block S, the acceleration of the hanging block H, and the tension in the cord. Let me first stress that in this case, the pulley is not rotating. It is just sitting there at rest. It is just a way to allow the cord to move to the other block. If the pulley is rotating, it will introduce extra forces, and we will discuss that later in chapter 10. But now we will assume that the pulley is not moving. It is sitting there, so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect the motion. And therefore, we have one system in here. The acceleration of this block will be equal to the acceleration of this block. They move like a unit. And therefore, the answer to A and B will be the same. The first step to analyze a dynamical problem like this one is to draw the free body diagrams and show the forces acting on the objects. Here it is. We have two objects here to, to consider, the sliding block and the hanging block. The rest is immaterial. These are massless. Let's look at the sliding block. Here is its free body diagram. There is the block. The forces acting on it are the gravitational force, perpendicular to the ground. The ground is here. It's perpendicular to the ground. And since it is sitting on a surface, there will be a normal force. What other force we have? We have the tension due to the cord, and the block is accelerating to the right. The free body diagram of the hanging block is shown in here. Here is the block represented by that dot. What forces are acting on it? The gravitational force, again perpendicular to the ground, and the tension in the cable, and it is accelerating downward. Now we will use these free body diagrams to analyze the situation using Newton's second law and find the unknowns. What are the unknowns? The tension and the acceleration. We have two unknowns to find in here. So let's do that. <clears throat> this is sample problem 503. Let's start with the sliding block, S. Its free body diagram, again, is here. It has mass capital M. This is its gravitational force, the normal force. It is sitting on a, on a surface. And this is the tension T. And here is the acceleration A. For the sliding block, okay, uh, sorry, the hanging block, the, this is the hanging block. This is the sliding. Its mass is m, so the gravitational force is small mg. There is the tension T due to the same core, and it is accelerating downward. Let's start with this one. The only thing we have is Newton's second law, F net. is equal to m a. We will apply to the two objects. So if we look at the first one, there is no motion in the vertical direction. The only motion we have is in the horizontal direction. So what do we have? We have capital M into A is equal to the net force. The only force in the x direction is the tension. So here is the first equation and we got it for the sliding block. Now let's do the same thing here. M into minus A, since A is in the negative y direction, is equal to the net force. What net force do we have? The tension is upward, it is positive, and the gravitational force is downward, so that is minus mg. Let's multiply through by minus one, so this would be small m a is equal to minus t plus small m g. And there is our second equation. What we will do now, you can combine these equations in any way you like. The way I will do it is I will add these two equations. Just add them. Capital m a plus small m a, take a as a common factor. So we have capital m plus small m 
into A is equal to T minus T is zero, and we are left with small m multiplied by G. So the acceleration of the system is equal to M divided by capital M plus a small m into G. Do we have the, the masses? Yes, the masses are given in the problem. Capital M is 3.3, .3, small m is 2.1. Put them in here, multiply by 9.8, and you will have this as 3.8 meters per second squared. Now you can go back to equation one to find the tension, and the tension is equal to capital M, capital M is 3.3, .3, multiplied by the acceleration, 3.8, and that will give us a value of 12.6 meters. And there we have it. Now, if you want to be more specific, the acceleration of the hanging mass, it is going in the negative y direction, so it will be minus 3.8j or 3.8 downward, depending on how the language of the problem is phrased. The acceleration of the sliding block is in the positive x direction. It's the same magnitude, 3.8i meters per second squared or 3.8 meters per second squared rightward. Okay, it depends on how the language is, uh, is phrased. So this is the first example we have on the application of Newton's laws. Let's now consider the next example where we have motion on an inclined plane, a very important type of motion, and therefore it is necessary to analyze such a motion. Uh, the problem says, in the figure, a cord pulls on a box up, so it is moving it up along a frictionless plane. Note that all the problems we do in chapter 5 are fric on frictionless surfaces. We will consider friction in the next chapter. So it is pulling it up along a frictionless plane inclined at an angle theta of 30 degrees. The box has mass M of 5 kilograms and the force from the core, the tension now, this is tension, is equal to 25 newtons. What is the box acceleration component A along the inclined plane. Well, like with the previous problem, we start by drawing the free body diagram of the object. Here it is. That's the physical situation, and this is the free body diagram. So this is the inclined plane. Our object is this dot. The forces acting on it are the gravitational force, which is always perpendicular to the ground, okay? The gravitational force is always perpendicular to the ground. And the normal force, since it is on a surface, there will be a normal force. And the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. And the third force is the pulling force, the tension due to the core. These are the forces acting on the object. Now we want to analyze the situation. And since the problem says what is the acceleration along the inclined plane, then a very convenient scale or axis to take in this case is to take our x-axis to be along the inclined plane and the y-axis will be perpendicular to that. What is the convenience of that? Then t will be along x, fn will be along y. It is only the gravitational force that will have x and y components. Okay, so we simplify two forces and end up with one complicated force that we have to analyze. Now let's look at the geometry here. Here is the geometry that we have to watch. Theta is the angle of the incline, and this is a line that is perpendicular to the ground that will make this a right angle triangle. How much is this angle alpha? If we look at this triangle here, how much is alpha? It is 90 minus theta. Alpha is equal to 90 minus theta. But if you look at this uh, situation here, let, let me, before we do that, from here, you can see that theta is 90 minus alpha, okay? Now let's look at this one. Remember that this line is this one, 
and it is perpendicular to the surface. So this angle here is again 90 degrees and therefore beta is equal to 90 minus alpha. Compare these two. What is your conclusion? Your conclusion will be that theta is equal to beta and therefore this angle is equal to that angle. Okay, and that's what we will always use from now on. The angle between the gravitational force and the normal to the surface is equal to the angle of the inclined circle. With this now, let's analyze the situation. Remember what we want to find is to find the acceleration along the incline, which is the acceleration along the x direction in this case. So <clears throat> here is our situation. This is sample problem. How much is that? 544. Sample problem. 504. And here is the situation. This is the inclined plane. There is our box. Okay, we're represented by a dot. This is the gravitational force and this is the normal force perpendicular to the surface here we have the tension that is our x direction and that is the y direction okay and we have seen that if this angle is theta then this angle is also equal to theta and the object is accelerating up along the inclined plane. We want to find that acceleration. Let's first look at the y component of the forces. Apply Newton's second law. What do we have? M A Y is equal to the net forces in the y direction. What do we have? We have the normal force and then we have, you can resolve the gravitational force into a y component and an x component. So here is the y component of the gravitational force and here is the x component of the gravitational force. The y component is next to the angle and mujawir lizawiya. So it will go with the cosine and therefore this is minus mg cosine of theta. Look at this triangle in here okay this is the force the side next to the angle will go with the cosine the side opposite to the angle will go with the sine now in this case the object is not moving up or down it's not jumping off the surface so there is no vertical acceleration and therefore the normal force is equal to mg cosine of theta okay that's all that's the only thing we can say from the y direction, okay? We can just find the normal force, which is immaterial in this problem. But if we have friction, as we will see in the next chapter, that will be a very important thing. Now let's look at the x direction. What is happening there? There is the acceleration that we want to find. So we have m a x, the acceleration along the incline, is equal to the net forces in the x direction, what do we have? We have the tension in the positive x direction. And then we have the x component of gravity in the negative x direction, so it is minus. How much is that? That's the side opposite to uh, the angle, al muqabil zawiya So that will go with the sine, mg sine of theta. And therefore the acceleration divided by m it will be T over M minus G sine of theta. Put in the numbers, the uh, tension is 25 Newtons. The mass of the box is 5 Newtons minus 9.8 times. The angle theta is 30 degrees, sine of that is one half, and that will give me the uh, magnitude of the acceleration and it is equal to it is equal to 0 0.1 0 
meters per second square. Note that we got a positive answer. That means the direction is correct. Now, someone may say, could we get a negative answer? Yes, we could get a negative answer because if the tension is not enough and the box is too heavy, the box will pull everything back. It will pull itself and whoever is pulling it up, it will not be able to pull it and he will fall with the box. In that case, the acceleration will be negative. Now, let's take a special case, okay, a very important special case. And that is, what if T is equal to zero? If we don't have tension, that means we bring the box and just put it at the top of the incline and release it. Remember that this is a frictionless incline. What will happen? The box will slide under its own gravitational force. What is the acceleration in that case? Well, if I come to this equation and put T equal to zero, then the acceleration will be minus G sine of theta. A very important situation that we'll refer to again and again. If you take a box, put it on a frictionless incline and let it fall under its own weight, this is its acceleration down the incline. Now ask yourself, does it make sense? Of course it makes sense. If theta is zero, that means the incline is horizontal, there is no acceleration. If the incline has an angle of 90 degrees, sine of that is one, and the acceleration is minus g, that's free fall, okay? Anywhere in between can be accounted for by this equation in here. So that is our second uh, example about the very important case of inclined planes. Now let's move to the third example we have in the book, which is about vertical acceleration. We have a system with vertical acceleration, and let's see the effect of that on the measurement of the weight of objects. The problem here says, in the figure, a passenger of mass 72.2 kilograms stands on a platform scale, okay? Yani mizal, a platform scale, like this one. This is the platform scale in an elevator cab. We are concerned with the scale readings, when the cab is stationary and when it is moving up or down. What will be the reading of the scale. Well, the reading of the scale is the normal force acting on the person. Here is the situation. The passenger, the person is there. The two forces acting on him are the gravitational force and the normal force. The scale readings will be the normal force because he pushes down, the reaction of the scale will be the normal force. So what we are looking for here is how much is the normal force exerted on the person by the scale. So, part A of the problem says, find a general solution for the scale reading, whatever the vertical motion of the cap. And now we have to analyze this very carefully. Let's first consider the case where we have upward acceleration. Upward acceleration. And please be careful. I'm not saying upward motion, I'm saying upward acceleration. Let's take the typical motion of the elevator. You go into the elevator and you want to go to an upper floor. So the elevator will start. As it starts, it will have an upward acceleration. It's going up and its speed is increasing. And then it will move with constant speed, zero acceleration. When it approaches the upper floor, it will start to decelerate. So it is going up, but with uh, a slowing speed, so the acceleration is down. Although it is going up, the acceleration is down. 
Now let's look at the case where you are coming down from a top floor to the ground. You go into the elevator, the elevator will start to move down. It is going down with increasing speed, so the acceleration is downward. As you reach the lower floor, it will start to slow down. So it is going down with a slowing speed, so the acceleration is upward. And that's what we have for. You can have upward acceleration while it is going up or while it is approaching the lower floor. Be careful about that. So, what will be the free body diagram in this case? Here is the object, the passenger. There is the gravitational force on it, the normal force. This is what we want to find. And it is accelerating upward, like when you go from the ground up. Apply Newton's second law to this situation. M A is equal to the net force, which is F N minus M G. So the normal force will be equal to, take this to the side, and take M as a common factor, it will be A plus G. <coughs> or, yeah, yeah, let's just write it in a symmetric way, G plus A, G plus A. If we have downward acceleration, downward acceleration, this is like when you start movement from the top down, or when you approach the top floor and you are slowing down, then there you have downward acceleration. What will be the situation? Here is the person, the normal force due to the scale reading, the gravitational force, and we have downward acceleration. What do we have in this case? Minus MA, because the acceleration is downward, is equal to F minus MG. Again, take this to the other side, take M as a common factor, and FN in this case is equal to M into G minus A. Compare the two. So if we have upward acceleration, the scale reading increases, if we have downward acceleration, the scale reading decreases, okay? And there are the two equations that we have for the two situations. Now, let me say that in the book, you only have this equation. But if you want to use it, you have to substitute A with its side. If it is going up, it is positive. If it is going down, it is negative. While what we have here if you want to use these equations, then you only have to substitute the magnitude of the acceleration because we already took care of the sign in here. Now, <coughs> the scale reading is, is, is called the apparent weight. The apparent weight of the person. The real weight is mg. The apparent weight is what happens when we have the acceleration. Part B, what does this scale read if the cab is stationary or moving upward at the constant speed of 0.5 meters per second? Well, if it is stationary or moving with constant speed, what's the acceleration? The acceleration is zero, okay? The acceleration is zero and therefore the normal force, whether it is going up or down, as, moving, as long as it is moving with constant speed, the acceleration is zero, and that is equal to mg, m is 72.2, multiplied by 9.8, and that would be 708 newtons. And this quantity here is called the true weight of the object. Okay, this is the true weight, the weight without any acceleration. Part C, what does the scale read if the cab accelerates upward at 3.2 meters per second squared or downward at 3.2 meters per second squared? Now we have acceleration, so let's see what will be the reading. If it is accelerating upward at 3.2, then the equation we use is this one. Fn will be equal to m into g plus a, which is 
times 9.8 plus 3.2, and that would be 939 newtons. If it is accelerating downward, then we will use this equation, okay, if n is equal to m into g minus a, and that will be equal to 477 newtons. So with upward acceleration, the person feels or appears to be very heavy. With downward acceleration, he appears to be a very light person, and that's the true weight of the object or the person. As continuation of this problem, let's look at some checkpoints attached to it. The first one is this one, checkpoint three, which is the same situation. But instead of the person, we have a block. Instead of the scale, we have the table. But otherwise, it is the same situation. We are dealing with a normal force in here. So, the problem says, <clears throat> The problem says, in the figure below, is the magnitude of the normal force greater than, less than, or equal to mg if the block and table are in an elevator moving upward at constant speed? Well, if it is moving at constant speed, the acceleration is zero, and the normal force is equal to mg. If it is moving uh, upward, with increasing speed, upward with increasing speed, means the acceleration is upward. If the acceleration is upward, where is that? The normal force will increase, and therefore it will be more than mg. A checkpoint four is very similar, but instead of dealing with the normal force, now we deal with the tension. But it is the same situation. We have upward or downward acceleration. So the, the checkpoint here says, the suspended body shown in the figure weighs 75 newtons. The weight, the true weight of the object, mg, is equal to 75 newtons. Is the tension equal to greater than or less than 75 newtons when the body is moving upward? Not that the body is moving upward at constant speed, increasing speed, or decreasing speed. Let's analyze that. The first one is easy. If it is moving upward with constant speed, then the acceleration is zero. If the acceleration is zero, these two forces are equal. T is equal to mg, which is equal to 75 newtons. Let's look at B. In B, the object is moving upward with increasing speed. Upward with increasing speed means the acceleration is upward. So let's draw the situation. Here is the situation. There is the tension. There is mg, and the acceleration is upward. Write Newton's second law for this one. ma is equal to t minus mg. So the tension is equal to, take this to the, that side, mg plus ma. This is 75. And this is something extra due to the acceleration. So the tension now will be more than mg by that much. And therefore, T is greater than 75 newtons, which is mg. C, the object is moving upward at decreasing speed. It is moving upward but slowing down. That means the acceleration is in the opposite direction. So in C, the situation will be like this. Here is the tension. There is the gravitational force, and now we have downward acceleration. Let's write Newton's second law for this one. M into minus A is negative, is equal to T minus mg. So take that to that side, T is equal to mg minus ma. This is the true weight, the 75. But now because of the downward acceleration, we have something less. So T is less than 75 newtons by that much, by of the object. Finally, we will look at the sample problem from the textbook, which is about Newton's third law. 
or third law force pairs. So let's see what do we have here. <coughs> The example says, <clears throat> the example says in the figure below, a constant horizontal force, if applied, of magnitude 20 newtons is applied to block A. So we have two blocks, they are touching, and we are pushing one of them. We are pushing A with a force that is directed to the right, has a magnitude of 20 newtons. It is applied to block A, of mass 4 kilograms, which pushes against block B of mass 6 kilograms. The blocks slide over a frictionless surface along an x-axis. What is the acceleration of the blocks? Well, if we want to find the acceleration, of course, they are pushed together, so they will have the same acceleration. And therefore, to find the acceleration, we treat the two boxes as a unit, and then find the acceleration of that unit. So, to find the acceleration, I don't know if this is from the old or the new textbook. Please check that. To find A, treat the two boxes as one unit okay so we have one unit one big unit of mass capital M it is being pushed by the applied force to give it some acceleration a of course here is the normal force and the gravitational force but we only care about the applied force because that's the direction of motion so what do we have capital M a is equal to F applied and therefore A is if applied divided by the total for uh, mass the applied force is uh, 20 newtons and the total mass is 4 plus 6 that is 10 so the, uh, the acceleration is 2.0 meters per second squared that's the acceleration of the system so it is the acceleration of A and it is the acceleration of B Part B, what is the horizontal force FBA, which is the force on block B from block A? We want the force on B. So let's isolate B and see what is happening there. This is block B. What are the forces acting on it? We have the normal force FNB, and we have the gravitational force MBG, and then what horizontal forces do we have? We have this force. Block A pushes B to the right. So that is the force F on B due to A. And that's what we want to find. And it is accelerating to the right. So forget about the Y direction because there is no motion there. Only focus on the X direction. I have MB multiplied by A is equal to FBA and therefore the requested force FBA is equal to the mass of B mass of B is 6 multiplied by the acceleration 2 and that will be 12 newtons let's now assume that you want to analyze the situation using A how does it look like well here is block A the forces on it are the normal force and the gravitational force. Here is the applied force. Okay, it is pushing A to the right. And as A pushes on B, B will react and push it in the opposite direction. So this is the force on A due to B. And the acceleration, of course, is to the right. So if we analyze the situation using A, again, we don't worry about the y direction let's look at the x direction m a into a is equal to f applied 
minus if AB. So if AB is equal to if applied minus, okay, you take that there, MA into A. How much is that? The applied force is 20 newtons minus the mass of A is 4. 4 multiplied by A2, that will be 8, and that will be 12 newtons exactly like we have in here. So the two forces are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. And these are uh, the examples on the applications of Newton's laws to analyze dynamical problems that we have in the book. Next time, our lecture will be continuation along the same lines, but we will consider problems, not examples, problems from the textbook on the applications of Newton's laws. Okay, today we continue our discussion uh, on chapter 5, where we will continue to consider applications of uh, Newton's laws. Let's first review the material we have covered in the chapter. Uh, we started the chapter by considering the concepts of force, mass, inertial frames. We stated Newton's laws of motions and discussed them in detail, especially the second law. And then we considered some special forces, the gravitational force, the weight, the normal force, tension, and friction. And then we considered applications of Newton's laws, where we did these four examples from the textbook on the applications of uh, Newton's laws. Today, we will see more problems on the applications of Newton's laws to uh, study or analyze the dynamical problems, but today we will deal with problems from the textbook. Now, let me say right from the beginning that I will solve the problems in detail. They may take a long time. It may be a lengthy uh, approach because the idea is not just to solve the problem, but to consider as many concepts connected to it as possible. But you, as, as a student, of course, you have to train yourself to uh, solve a given problem in a typical time of five minutes, which is the time allocated in the exam for a given problem. Here we will take our time to discuss all the ideas related to the problem. So let's start today here with problem number 48 from the textbook, which says in this figure, elevator caps, we have two elevator caps connected together, elevator caps a and B are connected by a short cable, that's this one here, and can be pulled upward or lowered by the cable above cable A, or cab A. Cab A has a mass of 1,200 kilograms. Cab B has a mass of 1,300 kilograms. A 12-kilogram box lies on the floor of cab A. The tension in the cable Connecting the cables, uh, connecting the caps, the tension in this cable is 1.91 times 10 to the power 4 newtons. What is the magnitude of the normal force on the box from the floor? Well, for that we have to find the acceleration of the system. If we find the acceleration of the system, then we will focus on this box, draw its free body diagram, and find the normal force on it. So how do we approach this problem? Well, first of all, we have to make a choice. Should we analyze cap A or should we focus on B? Let's see what is involved with each. Okay, just do sketchy work and then we will do it in, in detail. If I consider A, okay, then the forces I have to, uh, to, to, to consider are the tension in the top cable, T1, 
the tension in the lower cable T2 and the weight of this cap MAG and then I have the acceleration which could be upward or downward. Okay, so how many unknowns do I have? I have one, two. This is given, this is this value here. For B, if I consider B, I have the tension in the top cable which I call T2 here and I have its weight in BG and then I have the acceleration. How many unknowns do I have here? This one. So definitely I will go for B because that will be too many unknowns to, to deal with. This is one thing. So we did our homework and we know that we will consider B. Now let us find the direction of the acceleration if there is any acceleration. To do that, let's find the true weight of B. Okay, the gravitational force on B. MBG, how much is B? 1300 times 9.8. How much is that? <coughs> that is 1.176 times 10 to the power 4 newtons. Is that equal to the weight T2, which is this value? Compare the two numbers, they are different. So there is acceleration. Now is the acceleration upward or downward? Compare the tension to the weight. You can see that the tension is more than the weight and that will happen if the acceleration is upward like we did in the examples in the previous problem, uh, in the previous lecture. So now we know how does the three body diagram of B look like now we will focus on it and solve it in detail so here we are we did our preliminary homework now we will focus on cap B and we saw why draw its free body diagram here is cap B the free body diagram is the tension T in the cable between uh, the two caps and then we have its gravitational force MBG and we agree that the acceleration is upward. So now write Newton's second law for this. M B times A is equal to the net force, which is T minus M B multiplied by G, divided by the mass, so the acceleration is T over M B minus G. And that will be equal to, this is the tension in the cable connecting the two, which is this one, 1.91, 1 1.91 times 10 to the power 4, divided by the mass of cap B, which is 1300 kilograms, minus 9.8. This will give me a value of plus, very important, plus 6.12 meters per second squared. The plus sign tells me that the direction of the acceleration I took here is correct. Now we found the acceleration. This is the acceleration of the system. Everything in the system. Acceleration of A, acceleration of B, acceleration of the box, which is what we want to consider next. So now, the next step is to consider the box that is lying on cap A. Draw its free body diagram. Here we have the normal force due to the surface, we have its weight, m, g, and we have the acceleration upward. So write Newton's second law for this, m times a is equal to the normal force minus mg. So the normal force, take m there and take it as a common factor, m into g plus a. And this is equal to the mass of the box is 12 kilograms, so 12 multiplied by 9.8 plus 6.12, and that will give me the normal force on the box as equal to 191 newtons. There we have it. So this is a problem involving vertical acceleration, like the example we did from the book on the person in the elevator. 
Next, let us consider problem 49 from the textbook. Okay, typical problem, an object moving on a flat surface. Let's read the problem. The problem says, in this figure, a block of mass M, 5 kilograms, is pulled along a horizontal frictionless surface by a core that exerts a force of magnitude 12 newtons at an angle theta of 25 degrees. What is the magnitude of the block's acceleration? Okay, what is the magnitude of the acceleration of the block? So, we draw the free body diagram of the situation and find the acceleration from there. Okay, here is uh, our problem. We draw the free body diagram. Here is the surface, and there is the block. We represent it by a dot. This is its gravitational force, mg, the normal force, fn, and here we have the applied force, f, which makes an angle theta with the horizontal, and the box is accelerated to the right. So, uh, putting Newton's second law for this situation, we have ma, of course we are looking at the x direction, because that's where we have the motion, it's not moving vertically, and then we ask, what force do we have in the x direction? It is the x component of this force, which is f times cosine of theta. So the acceleration is f cosine of theta divided by m, which is equal to the force is 12 newtons, the angle theta is 25 degrees, and then the mass is equal to five kilograms, so that will give me uh, an acceleration of 2.18 meters per second squared. Okay, part B says the force magnitude F is slowly increased. You increase the force, okay, but keep the angle theta fixed. So you increase the force. What will happen? You can imagine that if the force is too high, it will start to pull the block from the surface, okay? So the problem says the force, of, the force magnitude F is slowly increased. What is the value of the force just before the block is lifted completely off the floor. At the moment that the block starts to leave the surface, what is the value of the force at that, uh, at that moment? When we ask ourselves, always we try to translate physical situations into mathematical situations. We ask ourselves, here is the block, okay, sitting on the surface. At the moment it leaves the surface, what will happen? The normal force will be zero, because the normal force is there because of the surface. If there is no contact between the block and the surface, there will be no normal force. So another way to ask the problem is, at what instant of time will the normal force be zero? Okay, that's the instant when it starts to leave the surface. So let us look at the normal force. To look at the normal force, we have to look at the y component of the forces. What do we have? Newton's second law, mAy is equal to, now what do we have? What do we have in the y direction? We have Fn, and then we have the y component of F, F sine of theta, and then we have the gravitational force, negative minus mg. There is no acceleration in the vertical direction, and therefore the normal force is equal to, take everything to the other side, mg minus f sine of theta. When the object loses contact, if we lose contact with the surface, it means that the normal force is zero, and that means if I set this equal to zero, I have mg minus f sine of theta is equal to zero, and that means that the value of the force F that will make this condition corresponds to mg divided by sine of theta. This is the critical value of the applied force that will make the object 
that will lift the object of the surface. How much is that? Well, F is equal to the mass is 5 kilograms times 9.8 divided by sine of 25 degrees. And if we put the numbers, this will be equal to 116 newtons. When your applied force reaches this value, the block will be lifted from the uh, surface. So part C says, what is the magnitude of the acceleration just before the block is lifted off the floor? That is, when we reach this value of the force, what will be the corresponding value of the acceleration? Here is the equation for the acceleration. Let's call that star. So we will go back to star and find the acceleration corresponding to this critical value of the force. And A critical, let's say A star, is equal to <clears throat> F critical, which is 116 times cosine of 25 divided by the mass 5. And the critical acceleration will be 21.0 meters per second squared. At that value of the acceleration, the block will be lifted uh, from the surface. Okay. Next, we move to problem 50. Okay. It's like the problem we did. In, uh, as, a, as an example from the textbook, but there we had only two blocks. Now, that the example we did was like this. Now we have three blocks, so we have extra tension forces here. Let's see what do we have. Problem 50 says. <coughs> In this figure, three boxes, A, B, and C, are connected by cords, okay? One cord, second cord. One of which, that's this cord here, one of which wraps over a pulley having negligible friction on its axle and negligible mass. So we, have, we don't have to worry about the masses of the cords or the pulley. The three masses are, MA is 30 kilograms, MB 30 kilograms and MC is 10 kilograms. When the assembly is released from rest, what will happen if this is a frictionless surface? The assembly will move that way. This will fall down and that will move to the right. So when the assembly is released from rest, what is the tension in the cord connecting B and C here? What is the tension in this cord? How far, that is the distance, how far does A move in the first quarter second, assuming it does not reach the pulley. So, as usual with any dynamical problem, we will find the, uh, we will first draw the free body diagrams, find the requested tension, and then to find the distance, we have to find the acceleration. So let's do that. We will start with A, draw its free body diagram. Here is the free body diagram of A. There is the normal force, it is moving on the surface, and this is the gravitational force, MAG, and there is the tension, let's call it T1. For B, okay, for B, which is the green one, we have the tension T1, it is the same chord, so if it is T1 here, it will be T1 there. And there is another tension due to the lower chord. Let's call that T2. And then we have its gravitational force, MB multiplied by G. The third block, C, the lower one, we have the tension in the cable between the two, which we call T2. We have its gravitational force, MCG. Where are the accelerations? The acceleration of this one is this way, and these two will accelerate downward. And it is the same magnitude of acceleration. So remember what we want. We want to find the acceleration, 
and we want to find T2, which is the tension in the cable between B and C. So <clears throat> let's write the three body diagram, uh, sorry, the uh, Newton second law for each one of them. For A, what do we have? We only have motion in the X direction. So it will be M of A times the acceleration is equal to T1. This is our first equation. For B, what do we have? We have MB times A. I will take this direction to be the positive direction. MB times A is equal to T2 plus MBG minus T1. And for C, again taking the direction of the acceleration to be positive, this is MC times A is equal to MCG, MCG minus T2. And this is our equation number three. Now, you can deal with this in any way you like. The easiest way for me is to add the three equations. <clears throat> and if I add them, you can see that T1 here will cancel T1, T2 will cancel T2. Just add. MAA, MBA, MCA. So I add the masses. Let me say that the total mass of all three boxes, I will call it capital M. Capital M into A is equal to what is left? These two which would be MB plus MC into G. Okay, and therefore, the acceleration is equal to MB plus MC over capital M multiplied by G. What is MB? 30, MC 10, so that will be 40 over <coughs> the total mass 30 plus 30 is 60, 60 plus 10 is 70, multiplied by 9.8, and that will be equal to, that will give me the acceleration <coughs> as equal to 5.6 meters per second square. Now, I can answer A, what is the tension in the core connecting B and C? That's what I call T2, okay? So I can go, for example, to equation three, back to equation three, from which you can see that T2 is equal to, <clears throat> I'll take this one here and this one there, take MC as a common factor, MC, and I have G here, and that will go there with a the negative sign, minus A. MC is equal to 10 kilograms, A is there, so I substitute and find that T2 is equal to 42 newtons. For part B, how far? What is the distance traveled by A? Well, there we go back to chapter two. We have an object that is moving with constant acceleration, it's starting from rest, isn't it? When the assembly is released from rest. So V initial is zero. What, what does that equation say? The equation we saw in chapter two says, x is v0 t plus one half a t squared. It started from rest, and therefore the distance moved by a, x a, is equal to one half a t squared. Okay? a is 5.6, the time requested is 0.25 seconds, square that, multiply it by a, divide by two, and you will find that it will move a distance of point. 175 meters. Okay, there is uh, the distance moved. <clears throat> so here we have a problem that involves both horizontal and vertical motion of several objects. The next problem we will consider is a classic problem of mechanics. 
and that is this machine here, which is called Atwood machine. That's the name of the person who came up with that machine. So let's see what do we have. Problem 51 says, the figure shows two blocks connected by a cord of negligible mass that passes over a frictionless pulley, also of negligible mass. The arrangement is known as Atwood machine. One block has mass M1, 1.3 kilograms. The other one is more massive. It has a mass of 2.8 kilograms. What are the magnitude of the block's acceleration and the tension in the core? Again, we will assume that the pulley is stationary. It is not rotating. If it is rotating, we will revisit this problem later in chapter 10, taking the rotation of the pulley into account. But now, the pulley is fixed, it doesn't rotate, it is frictionless and massless. So it is just a way for the core to go over and bend to the other direction. Remember what we want? We want two things, the tension in the core and the acceleration of the system. Like the other problems, we will start by drawing the free body diagrams of the objects and then proceed to find the unknowns. So let's start by finding the three body diagrams. Here we have two objects, M1, this is the lighter one. So there is the tension, T, and there is its gravitational force, M1G. And of course, if we release the system, the heavier one will go down, the lighter one will go up. So the acceleration of this will be upward. For the heavy one, M2, the free body diagram will be this way, T, it is the same tension on the two sides of the core, and then we have its gravitational force, M2G, and since it is heavier, it will accelerate downward, so that is the direction of its acceleration. Now, write Newton's second law for the two, and solve the problem simultaneously. For M1, Newton's second law says, M1 times A is equal to the net force. T is positive in the direction of the acceleration. And then we have M1 times G. Let's call this equation number one. For M2, the heavy mass, let's take the direction of the acceleration to be positive. So that is M2A is equal to, this will be positive, M2G minus T. That is our second equation. Like we did here, the easiest thing to do is to add these two equations. And if we do so, you will see that the tension will cancel. So M1 plus M2 is the total mass, capital MA, is equal to M2G minus M1G. So take the G as a common factor. You have M2 minus M1 multiplied by G. So the acceleration of the system is M2 minus M1 divided by capital M into G. This is equal to M2 is 2.8 minus M1, 1.3 divided by the sum of the two, the sum of the two masses, this is problem 51, the sum of the two masses, we can add it, uh, 2.8 plus 1.3. 2.8 plus 1.3, that will be 4.1, and the whole thing is multiplied by 9.8. So the acceleration of the system is equal to 3 point plus huh, 3.59 meters per second squared. The plus means the direction of the acceleration that we selected is correct naturally because the heavier one will go down and the lighter one will go up. So that is the acceleration. What else do we need? The tension. You can go either to one or two and find the tension. Let's go back to one. Back to equation one. The tension T, take this to that side and take M1 as a common factor. It will be M1 G plus A and that will be equal to where is M1? 1. 30 multiplied by 9.8 plus 
17.59 and that will give us the tension as 17.4 newtons. There we have the tension in the system. And this is the analysis of the famous Atwood machine. <clears throat> Next, we will move to problem 54, okay, where we have many, many tensions involved. Okay, let's read the problem. The problem says the figure here shows four penguins that are being playfully pulled along very slippy, okay, very slippery, frictionless ice by a curator. So this is a smooth surface. The masses of three penguins and the tension in two of the courts are M1, 12 kilograms, M3, 15 kilograms, M4, 20 kilograms. The tension T2 in this core is equal to 111 newtons. The tension T4, which is the external force by the external, uh, by the uh, person, is 222 newtons. Find the penguin mass M2 that is not given. What is the mass of this penguin? So what we are given, okay, are these values. I will call this M2, this is what we want to find, and I will call the tension in this core T1, which is not given. We are given here and there. Remember what we want? We want the value of this mass. So let us analyze this problem. And the way we will proceed is like the previous problems. We will start by considering the system. So here is what we have. <clears throat> this is problem 54. We will first consider the whole assembly. Okay? Considering all penguins to be one thing, one object. Consider the whole assembly. So what do you have? All of this is one object that is being pulled by that force. The acceleration of the system is equal to T4 divided by capital M. So just take all the penguins as one object of mass capital M, and that object is being pulled by the hand with a force that is equal to T4. This is the total mass again. So here is our equation one. And now let's start to go through them one by one until we get what we want and the stop. Let's start from this one because this is the easiest. There is only one tension here. For this one, two tensions. For this one, two tensions. For this one, two tensions. This is the only one that has one tension there. So let's consider the first thing we consider M1. Draw its free body diagram. It looks like this. This is M1. So the applied tension to this one, I will call it T1. And this is the normal force on it. And this is the gravitational force, M1g, and it is accelerated to the right. So Newton's second law for this one is very simple. M1 times A is equal to T1. And this is our second equation. Then we move to M2. And we do the same thing. Consider M2. Draw its free body diagram. It will look like this. There is the tension T2. Do we have that given? T2, yes, 111. And here we have the tension T1 in this cable. Okay. And then we have the normal force Fn2 and the gravitational force M2g, and it is accelerated to the right. So Newton's second law for this one says M2 times A is equal to T2 minus T1. 
T2 minus T1. And this is our equation number three. Now we will substitute from equation two to equation three. That is, we will take T1 from here and put it there. So what do we have? We have M2A is equal to T2 minus M1A, M1A. And therefore, take M1 to this side, M1 plus M2 into A is equal to T2. And this will be M1 plus M2 multiplied by A, which is there, T4 over the total mass, M1, M2, M3, M4 is equal to T2. At this point, let's pause and check what do we have. Do we have the mass M1? Yes, that's 12 kilograms. So we have this and that. Do we have the mass M2? No, that's what we want to find. Okay, so this is unknown. Do we have T4? 222. Yes. M2 is unknown. M3, it's given 15 kilograms. M4 is 20 kilograms. T2, 111 newtons. So the only unknown in this equation is the mass M2 that we are looking for. It's a little bit of algebra, but otherwise it is straightforward. So solve this equation for M2, and if you do so, you will find that the mass of the unknown penguin will be equal to, that's a little bit of algebra there, nothing more, the mass of that penguin, M2, is equal to 23 kilograms. Okay, there we have it. And this is a problem involving many tension forces to be. The next problem will be a problem involving contact forces, and that's where we have Newton's third law. This is similar to the problem we did in the class. The problem here says, this is problem uh, 55 in the textbook, and it says the following. <clears throat> It says two blocks are in contact on a frictionless table. A horizontal force is applied to the larger block, as shown in the figure. If M1 is 2.3 kilograms, M2 1.2 kilograms, and the applied force that pushes the green block is 3.2 newtons, find the magnitude of the force between the two blocks. What is the magnitude of the force between them? To do that, we have first to find the acceleration and then find the contact force between them. So, we will uh, consider them, as we said in the class, consider them to be one unit and find the acceleration accordingly. So, here is problem 55. A is equal to the applied force F divided by the total mass. We treat them like a unit. And that will be equal to the applied force is 3.2 divided by 2.3 plus 1.5, that would be 3.5, okay? 3.5 kilograms, and that will give me the acceleration as 0.91 meters per second squared. To find the contact force, I will consider the block M2 because it is easier, less forces on it. And if I draw its free body diagram, it will look like this. Uh, there is the force from M1 on M2. As M1 moves, it will push M2 to the right. So that is the force F21, the force on 2 due to 1. 
and then we have the normal force and then we have the gravitational force and the acceleration is to the right right newton second law for this f21 is equal to m2a m2 is equal to uh, 1.2 multiplied by 0.91 and that will be equal to 1.1 newtons there is the force between the two blocks. Now let us consider part B. Part B says, show that if a force of the same magnitude is applied to the smaller block, but in the opposite direction, that is, instead of pushing them this way, let me say now I bring the force, the same force, and apply it this way to push the smaller one. Okay, show that if a force of the same magnitude F is applied to the smaller block but in the opposite direction the magnitude of the force between the blocks is 2.1 not 1.1 like we found here that is if I reverse the direction of the application of the force the contact forces between the two will become different which is not the same value as calculated in A and then explain the difference so let us first prove that first we, no we, we note that the acceleration will have the same value, okay? Whether you push them this way or that way as a unit, the acceleration will not change. So now let us uh, focus on M2, okay? The same block that we have there. What is its free body diagram? M2 will push M1 that way, so M1 will push it that way. And therefore, this is the force F to one and now we have the applied force here the applied force will be applied this way now so that is f applied and then we have the normal force and the gravitational force and now the acceleration is in this direction right newton second law this one will be minus m2a because the acceleration is in the negative fixed direction is equal to F21 positive minus F. Okay, so F21 is equal to F minus M2A. The applied force is 3.2 minus M2 is 1.9 times the acceleration 0.91. And if you put these numbers, you will get the number that he is referring to, which is 2.1 Newtons, okay? Which is different from that one. So the, the, the bottom line of this problem is that the contact force is not constant. It depends on where and how do you apply the external force. In this case, the contact force was small because the big box will not find any problem pushing the small one. Whereas in here, it's a huge force compared to that one because the small box will find a lot of difficulty pushing the bigger one. And that's why we have the difference between the two boxes. We finally conclude with one more problem. This one involves, uh, uh, this one will involve uh, inclined planes and that is problem 64 in the textbook so let's see what do we have here and we will conclude with it so let me remove this one and read the problem the problem says, the figure shows a box of mass M2, one kilogram, on a frictionless plane inclined at an angle theta of 30 degrees. It is connected by a cord of negligible mass to a box of mass M1, 2.5 kilograms, on a horizontal frictionless surface. The pulley is frictionless and massless. 
if the magnitude of the horizontal force F is 2.3 newtons, so there is a force that pushes this this way. As it pushes it this way, that one will go down. So the magnitude of the force is 2.3 newtons. What is the tension in the connecting cord? What is the tension there? So like always, like we did with the previous ones, we will start by drawing the free body diagram and then proceed to find the unknown. So in this case, the free body diagrams will look like the following. The one on the horizontal surface will be like this. What is it called? That's M1. So here is the box M1. We have the gravitational force, M1G, the normal force, it is moving on a surface, Fn1. And then we have the tension T in the cord and we have the pushing force. So we have two forces pointing, pointing to the right, that's F, and it is accelerating that way. For the one on the inclined plane, it looks like this. This is the angle theta. Here is the block M2, We're represented by a dot. This is its gravitational force, M2, G, and this is the normal force perpendicular to the surface, so that is Fn2, and what do we have? We have the cord, so the tension in the cord, T. If this angle is theta, okay, if this angle is theta, then this angle here is also theta, and this one is accelerating in that direction. So I will take that to be my x-axis and that will be my y-axis. Okay, and then we have the free body diagrams of the two masses. Now we will write Newton's second law for each one of them, solve the equation simultaneously to find the tension in the core. If we start with M1, this is M2 here. If we start with M1, Newton's second law says it's only motion in the x direction. So M1A is equal to the forces in the x direction, which are F plus T. This is our equation number one. For M2, I will consider the forces along the x-direction. So I have M2A, take that to be the positive direction, and then I will analyze the gravitational force in the component in the y-direction and a horizontal component, okay? A horizontal component, and this is the angle theta. This component is opposite to the angle theta, so it will go with sine. And therefore, what do I have in the x direction? I have the x component of gravity, which is m2 g sine of theta, the opposite to the angle. And then I have the tension in the opposite direction, minus the tension. So, easiest thing is, like we did before, add the two equations. And if you do so, you can see that the tension will cancel. So this will cancel that. And what do we have? We have the total mass, M, multiplied by A is equal to T2. M2 G sine of theta plus F. So the acceleration of the system is equal to M2 G sine of theta plus F divided by the total mass, which will be equal to M2 is the mass on the incline, which is equal to one kilogram times 9.8. Theta is 30 degrees, right? Sine of that is one half. Plus the applied force, which is equal to 2.3 Newtons. And all of that is divided by the total mass, which is 
plus 1, that will be 3.5. So the acceleration of the system is 2.1 meters per second square. What do we want? We want, uh, we want the tension, T. So go back to equation 1, back to equation 1, from which you can see that the tension is equal to, take this to the other side, M1A minus the applied force F. We found the acceleration there. We know what is M1 and F. So substitute and you will find that the magnitude of the tension is 3 newtons. Okay. Now let's look at part B. Part B says, what is the largest value the magnitude of F may have without the cord becoming slack, loose. Well, let's think about it. In this case, you want to increase the magnitude of the force F. If you make it a very large force, then the tension in the cord will be lost, okay? It becomes uh, a loose or slack cord, and there will be no more tension in it. So, what is the maximum value of F that will make the tension zero, after which the tension becomes zero? That's what we are looking at here. The, the value of F that will make the uh, cord slack means the tension zero. So, what is the, force, the value of F that will make the tension equal to zero? Let's find out. If the cord, if the cord, is slack, then the tension T is equal to zero. What we have to do is go to equation two, set the tension equal to zero, and solve. So back to two. Someone may say, why don't we go to one? Set the tension equal to zero. That's okay, but then you have two unknowns, F and A. That's why we go to 2, because in 2, if I set the tension equal to 0, the only unknown will be the acceleration. So we go back to 2, set the tension T equal to 0. What is left? M2A is equal to M2G sine of theta, which means that the acceleration will be equal to G sine of theta. Did we see this before? Yes. That's if you take a block place it on a frictionless inclined plane, let it fall on itself, that is its acceleration. Because now, there is no tension. There is nothing that binds this block, so it will, it will fall on its own, and that's its acceleration. So this is equal to uh, 9.8 times 1 half, that will be 4.9 meters per second squared. Now we go back to 1, back, to equation one with t equal to zero. Find f, this is the critical f. That is equal to m1 times a. m1 is equal to 2.5 times 4.9, and that will be equal to 12.3 newtons. So you start with 2.3, everything will be okay, Keep increasing the force. When you reach 12.3, the cord will become slack, the tension is lost, and the two blocks will move almost independently of each other. And that concludes our discussion on the applications of uh, Newton's laws, especially Newton's second law, to solve and analyze dynamical problems. And that completes our discussion of chapter five, our first chapter on forces.